Alleluia, Christ is risen. Do you really believe it? It's a serious question this morning. It's a serious, real question. Do we really believe that Christ is risen? We're good at paying lip service to it. And I introduced it in a cute way last week in our children's sermon, and I told them that it was the earliest of Christian creeds or the statement of belief even way before the Nicene or Apostles or Athanasian Creed ever existed. It's what you said if you were an early follower of the way, that's the Jesus movement, and it was the truth of your life. But do we really believe that Christ is risen? And maybe more importantly, if we believe it, then does the resurrection have any importance still on us or on our world? See, we're in really dangerous territory this morning because this is the week after Easter. The week after something big or some big important event is always a little bit of a letdown, especially after Easter, because once we've discovered the empty tomb, it can be really easy to let resurrection slip away or get overlooked or just let it slink into the shadows. A couple of years ago, a Catholic priest, a sought-out speaker, and a gifted writer, uh, Richard Rohr, wrote this in a, in a devotion meditation. He says, Christianity is a lifestyle, a way of being in the world that is simple, nonviolent, shared, and loving. However, we made it into an established religion and all that goes with that, and avoided the lifestyle change itself. One could be warlike, greedy, racist, selfish, and vain in most of Christian history and still believe that Jesus is one's personal Lord and Savior. The world has no time for such silliness anymore. The suffering on earth is too great. The danger is that we have made resurrection just the, another thing that you need to believe in the church rather than something that you experience. For these next couple of weeks in Easter, we get to look at gospel readings from St. John and St. Luke who help us fill out how Jesus appears to his disciples after he's raised from the dead. And they also tell of the community's struggle with what a post-resurrection life looks like. And this morning we get St. John's retelling of Resurrection Evening. This is Easter evening, and it should sound familiar because we get it every single year on the second Sunday of Easter. We know it probably most and best is Doubting Thomas Day, but I really don't think that's fair, and you'll hear why in a minute. Let's remind ourselves of the setting. The disciples are gathered on the evening of the first day of the week in a house where they were staying Mary Magdalene had come to them earlier in the day from the tomb with a message that she had seen the Lord. But for whatever reason, the disciples remained locked in this room for fear of the Jews, which is simply John's way of saying the religious leaders who put Jesus to death. Certainly not all Jewish people. And all that's understandable, them locking themselves in this room. They're probably all wondering if they did that to Jesus and they knew that these guys followed Jesus, then which one of them is going to be next? But it's into the midst of that room that Jesus comes in his resurrected body that can show and still bear the scars on his hands and his side. And twice in this encounter with them, he says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Then he breathes on them and he invites them to receive the Holy Spirit. And he commissions them saying, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Thomas isn't with them, of course, when all of this happens. We don't know where he is. I've joked in the past that he's the guy who drew the short straw and had to go get more bread for dinner, or the wine ran out, or maybe he simply had someone who needed to talk to him that day. We don't know, but in any case, the disciples tell Thomas the same thing that Mary does. They say, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas replies with his most famous line, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And lest we do the judgy thing that church people are prone to do to Thomas, let's just remember that nowhere in that phrase does Thomas say that he doubts his brothers and sisters. Thomas isn't and shouldn't be the scapegoat for our own doubt and confusion and frustration. 
And he shouldn't be shamed for what he says either. Because the truth is, he only wants what the others got. He wants an experience of and to see Jesus. And as I said in my sunrise sermon on Easter last week, and I said on Thursday night in the Gospel of John for St. John, the only thing that he wants for his readers is for them to see Jesus. And I can only bet that that's true for us too. At my core, I've always wanted to see Jesus, and I know that you do too. Thomas gets his chance, though. He gets his chance the next week. Jesus loves his disciples to the end, and he comes back and he tells Thomas to touch his wounds and don't doubt but believe. Thomas's doubt turns him away from the good news and away from Jesus, but seeing brings him back, and seeing Jesus means being in a relationship with him, like Mary Magdalene is that Easter morning, like the disciples were that Easter evening. All are in relationship with Jesus. All are living that resurrection reality that's all around them and all around us, too. You want to know what resurrection is all about? It's all about being in relationship with God and with our neighbors or the community that God and Jesus are continually creating in their midst. That relationship is one of love and peace. As we can see here, anything else is a blatant lie. But I want to go back, go back with me to one important verse this morning. John chapter 20, verse 23. It's the one where Jesus commissions the disciples the first week to forgive sins. And if they forgive the sins of someone, they are forgiven. If they retain the sins of any, they are retained. I've come to agree with the work of scholar Sandra Schneiders, who has reminded us that in the Greek, in that second phrase, the ending, there is no word sins that's repeated. Scholars have assumed that that's how the grammar works, but it's not there. Schneider's herself says a more accurate reading would be this. Of whomever you forgive the sins, they, the sins, are forgiven to them. Whomever you hold fast or embrace, they are held fast. So at the end of that, Jesus really says, if you hold fast to someone, they are held fast. It's not the sins that matter, it's the people, it's the relationship. So why the grammar lesson, why does that matter for us? Simply because that's the resurrection and that's what I believe the life of faith to be all about. The power in my life that propelled me into being a pastor and into these ventures of which I cannot see the ending was simply a resurrection encounter that came not from the voice of Jesus, though Jesus may have been speaking through my therapist. He said to me one day, Travis, right now it's like you're a little cat that's stuck up in a tree waiting for the person who's going to come and pull you down. But I have no doubt later you will be the person to climb up that tree and reach out your hand to others. If you hold fast to someone, they are held fast. And the church for me has always been the people who have surrounded me and held me fast when I couldn't even prop my feet up or stop cutting or trying to kill myself long enough to know that there were other people holding me as Christ holds the church. And with every fiber of my being, that's what I want the world to know. I want the world to know that it's beheld and beloved by a God who is bold enough to send the Holy Spirit into us to do the holding. Why do I think you should invest yourself in this community of faith? Because even though we can be mean and crabby and we can hold grudges and we can be fearful of change and distrusting of anything that's new or different, we are still one of the most kindest and loving communities that I know. There are people here who will hold you so that you are held fast. Sometimes we need to be reminded that that's our responsibility, but we will hold you so that you may know that Christ beholds you too. For all of our years to come, we will cultivate doing this for each other and for the world because that is the resurrection life. So Jesus comes this morning 
to us, to the disciples, in the midst of this dangerous time, into the midst of locked rooms, into the midst of fear, he breathes on the disciples who will then breathe on the world, the Holy Spirit, who continues to make Jesus known to us even today. We continue telling this story of Thomas because we need to be reminded again and again that Jesus continues showing up alive and with scars to hold both the worst that has happened to him and also the best of resurrected life. And we, we are those disciples who are called and sent to show the world the resurrection and the fullness of the relationship that Jesus offers. So remember the four words that I told our children are so important? Peace be with you. Amen.